Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 25th of April 2014. Welcome to all listeners, existing ones, new ones. Truth Sentinel has been on the move. We've been through Holland, through Turkey, we're in Ukraine, returning to the UK at some point soon. Uh, today's news. Ukraine attack has drawn threats from Putin. Uh, Ukrainian troops um, went into Slovyansk in eastern Ukraine to try to get rid of the pro-Russian uh, people that had taken over police uh, offices there. And um, President Putin has warned of consequences to these actions. Um, and his consequences are probably going to be a little bit more scary than the consequences threatened by the EU and the US of scary, scary sanctions affecting um, almost no one, really. Um, US soldiers have arrived in Poland for NATO exercises. I'm sure that's purely coincidental. They're not just moving them over there so they can get ready for the war that they're all planning uh, in, in uh, Ukraine, which is almost inevitable, in my opinion. There's a war of words continuing now between Russia and the US, accusing each other of failing to de-escalate the crisis in Ukraine. Benjamin Netanyahu has said that uh, Mahmoud Ab Abbas must uh, stop the pact with Hamas if he wants um, there to be any chance of peace talks resuming. A Syrian government airstrike on a market um, in a rebel-held town killed more than about uh, 20 people according to activist groups and lots of atrocities still continuing in Syria most of it sort of being unseen by the rest of the world who knows what's really going on there and I fear that some of that could happen in Ukraine as well unless something's done to stop it Malaysia's PM has told CNN he will release a report about the plane's disappearance but um, he's not yet prepared to declare the passengers and crew dead which is at least good but I don't think the families um, of the passengers on the disappearing plane are, gonna, are happy with some of the other things he said in his recent interview. Uh, other news in the week, um, most of it's been dominated by the ferry disaster. South Korean authorities have searched the offices of the company that owns that ferry and um, the billionaire whose family appears to control the company sounds extremely suspect. Um, basically, I'm not going to try and pronounce his name, let's call him Yu because um, that's part of his name, his first name I believe. Um, basically, in 1987 he was a religious cult leader and more than 30 people from his group were found dead, bound and gagged in a factory outside of Seoul. Um, officials investigate the incident, um, but found no evidence tying the event to you. Hmm. I would say there's some circumstantial evidence there. He was their cult leader, and they were all found dead and gagged. Um, I find that extremely suspicious, and I certainly, if I knew that he owned the company um, of the ferry that I was on board, I'd want to get off as quickly as possible. Um, in the last episodes, we talked about Malaysian flight, flight uh, MH370. We spoke to Sarah Bajak. Um, and um, there'll be some more of the conversation we had um, today. Just the recording of the conversation we had before and after the main interview. Some of it may be of interest. And we spoke about Ukraine. We spoke to Alexander. And there'll be some more of uh, his interview today. And we just talked about general news in the world as well. Remember to leave any ideas for topics in the comments section. Uh, we plan to interview as many guests as we can of interest. Um, if you know someone who would like to come on the show, or if you're listening you'd like to come on the show, please uh, get in contact. So, uh, back to the ongoing search for MH370. Uh, we spoke to Sarah Bajak, partner of Philip Wood, um, on one of the passengers um, last episode. Here's some of the conversations uh, we had before and after the main interview. It just seems to be, I don't know, an accumulation of evil happening in the world right now. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just more sensitive to it. I mean, maybe this has been happening all the way along, but but I don't think so. It it, it does seem to be spinning a bit. Right no, now. I I completely agree with you. Um, 
that it's, it's, everything seems to have escalated in the last sort of few couple of years. You know, I'm, I'm actually in Ukraine at the moment um, doing some sort of on the ground reporting over here. And uh, obviously it's it's not looking good over here. I mean, potential World War Three about to start here. One of the theories is that Russia is behind the disappearance of the plane. You never know. I mean, uh, all of these things might be tied up in some way. I mean, it does seem like something's happening, like around the world, all of a sudden, as well as things that have been happening in the last sort of year, um, all of a sudden these things could be connected. You know, they often are, you know, because we don't know the full story behind a lot of these events. Yeah, we, we don't know. But, but it does seem to be a, a certain escalation of bad things happening. And, and there, there's got to be some underlying themes to it. So, I don't know. It, it's hard to tell. It really is. Um, I mean, you know, who, who knows what goes on with the secret services and CIA, MI5 and all that lot. And, and now the media, I mean, whilst, the, you know, it's, I follow obviously CNN and BBC, um, it does seem like there's less in investigative reporting these days and anything that's branded slightly, anything that's slightly off the official story seems to be branded a conspiracy these days, but I don't think it's always the case. No, it's not. And uh, well, I mean, some of the news agencies are doing a better job than others. I mean, I, actually, I think CNN is doing quite a good job of exploring the, the factual side of things. I mean, they don't make a whole lot of pronouncements as they should. I don't think the media necessarily should make pronouncements. But they've at least had lots of experts come in who look at the data and give the pro and the con of both sides of the story. So... I mean, I think they're doing a better job than most, but in the end, if our governments aren't doing that for us, <clears throat> we have to rely on the media. And if you look at the major conspiracies that indeed have been true, right? It's not just theory at a certain point. It becomes truth. It becomes fact. You know, whether it's Iran-Contra or the whole Iraq war spin up out of 9-11, or the entire Vietnam experience, you know, JFK shooting, um, what else, uh, Watergate. There's also, you know, I mean, there's also the NSA. I mean, the people were saying that all our phone calls are being recorded, all our emails are being read, and everyone said, oh, you're a paranoid conspiracy theorist, but it turns out it's true, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't actually that I've I've believed that to be true for twenty years. I yeah. mean anybody who has been having a fallacy of privacy is just you know, they're just stupid. I've never assumed that I have any privacy. So that NSA thing with Snowden, I'm like, Yeah, so what's the point? I mean yeah. <laughs> do you guys not realize that this is true? I mean, this is just so obvious. Do you know who Ai Weiwei is? No. He's a uh, uh, dissident in China. He's an artist. Okay. You can look him up. AI uh -huh. is his surname. Uh, in Chinese, they put the surname first. So I, Wei Wei. So AI, and then W E I, W E I. Okay. Yeah. He's a, a famous artist and political dissident, and he was my neighbor. Um, actually, his son was my neighbor at my old apartment and he spent a lot of time with his son when he was under house arrest and we became friends so I've known him for you know probably six of the seven years that I've lived here and he has just a really interesting take on it he's like you know I know they watch everything I do you know they they, they probably have uh, you know a, a secret camera planted in my toilet there are some things that should be private why? I mean, all people shit, so what's the big deal? I, I mean, his point is, it's a human condition, so if everybody does it, everybody has to toilet, everybody showers, everybody has sex, everybody eats, everybody does all of these things, so none of those things are really private, because they are just the human condition, right? The only privacy that we have is our individual thoughts. And uh, the minute we speak them, they're no longer private. So it's really an interesting take on privacy. And, uh, you know, so 
my personal feeling is that as long as you are not doing anything wrong, you're not breaking the law, obviously, you're not hurting anybody else, then there's actually a certain amount of security in that. So I live a very public life. I've lived a public life for 20 something years. Now the last couple of years have been less public because I left business and went into teaching. Mm -hmm. But now it's become public again because of what's happened. But there's protection to me in that because I'm a very known quantity. It would be very difficult for anybody to make an accusation against me because thousands of people know me and have known me for two dozen years, or I mean, they've known me my whole life. I mean, I still have active connections with people who've known me since I was a toddler, right? So there's a certain amount of, of comfort and confidence and security in the lack of anonymity. So, um, you know, I, I don't, there's nothing new to say. At a certain point, we have to have some break in the story. Yeah, it would be nice if there was one. Um are you going back to work soon then? Oh, I've been working the whole way through. Wow. Yeah, I missed, uh, so they went, mi the flight went missing on the 8th, which was a Saturday. And so I missed the Monday, Tuesday. I, I was just too fractured. I couldn't, I couldn't keep myself composed. That's understandable, I think. And I've been back every day. I haven't missed. I haven't missed a single teaching lesson, actually. So all my media I schedule either before or after school. And uh, then last week, I realized I was just kind of killing myself slowly, so I couldn't keep doing that. Does it help to keep your mind off things? Oh, absolutely. You know, schools are very happy places, first of all, and uh, children have an empathy that is so much more real and less invasive than adults. You know, you can know that they're thinking about you without them making you go into tears because they just let me be normal. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm the same teacher that they've had and they work hard. You know, what the, the one positive outcome of this, well, there's lots of silver linings to any cloud, but one of the silver linings is, man, they're on their best behavior. So much compliance in homework being turned in and, and good behavior in class. It's like they're all on their tiptoes. So, um, so that's a good thing. How old, how old are they? How old are your students? Uh, I teach A-levels. Okay, yeah. And do they talk about what's happened? Do you talk about it in class or not? Uh, at the beginning, we did a little bit because, you know, we would try to start class and there would always be one or two kids with their heads down, like they they couldn't face me mm -hmm. because uh, they're pretty astute children. I mean, a, I mean we're, we're talking about kids who are 17, 18, 19 years old, right? Because I teach IGCSE and A-levels in a British school. And... Um, and so they're pretty sophisticated kids, and so they know what's going on, and they watch the news, and they saw me on CNN, and uh, and you could tell it was really hard for them. And so I don't, I, I mean, I don't believe in lying to children. I think you need to hit it head on. And so I just talked to him about it. I'm like, look, you know, it's an awful thing. You know, I'm crushed personally. I'm confused. I don't know what else is going on. But the one thing I know is that I have to keep going with my life. And uh, I need to keep working, and I love my job, and I care about you guys, and I want you to do well in your exams. So the only way we can make this work is if we all pretend like nothing else has happened, and we just keep going. So, you know, you have to know I'm sad. I have to know you're sad. But if we could just kind of ignore it during class, then we can all just kind of keep moving forward. And, and I had that conversation with all of my students and the school was extremely supportive and they allowed me to make kind of a statement to all of the staff and all of the students and the families basically saying the same thing. And so by the end of the first week back at school, life has kind of returned to normal. I mean, it's not normal, but at least my daily life is normal. And frankly, I think that saved me because I talk to a lot of the other families, you know, some of the Chinese families who have stayed holed up in the Lido Hotel the whole time, they're going crazy. They have all sorts of psychological problems. They have health problems. You know, they're just, they're drowning, you know, and, and I keep telling them, get out of that hotel, go home. 
Mm-hmm. Go back to your work. You know, just have a normal life. I mean, you can you can still do media. You can still um, research things. You can still talk to officials, but you can't let that ruin everything. Take it easy and I'll speak to you again soon, yeah? Okay, good night. Good night. So I hope Sarah's um, still doing okay and maybe we'll get a chance to speak to her again at some point. Sarah sent me um, a mail uh, with some details from the family. They're quite angry at the moment and they really want to escalate things. I don't blame them really. Um, I think there's definite answers that need to be, definite questions that need to be answered at the moment. Um, The families have asked for the Kandahar stories that the uh, Russian press uh, reported on. Uh, about the possible hijack scenario there that they need to be investigated and just see you know is any is there any truth in that and I think that's a natural question to ask there's, there's too much time being spent looking in the sea and not enough time at all being spent looking on the land at all uh, they want the Inmasat data checked that's also um, a fair thing to ask because it's the first time that any such data has been relied upon to locate a missing airplane so it should be checked They want the cargo manifest released, and why not? Because um, everything these days seems to be secretive, like we don't deserve to know, but we we fly on these planes ourselves. They should be given this information. They also want the black box serial number. Um, I mean, if I I would ask for that just purely because if if one's found, I want to know if that's definitely the one from MH370. Um, A lot of these questions have not been answered, so the families are understandably not happy at the moment. A Fox executive was sacked for trying to raise money for families of MH370 on the understand they would waive their right to sue anybody about this accident, which sounds extremely suspect behaviour. I wonder who was paying her. Um, Let's hope we find out more about the plane anyway. um, Next to Ukraine, where the Ukrainian army are taking part in an operation to deal with the takeover of the buildings in the east. And they seem to have definitely taken back some parts of that. And I've seen photos of roadblocks where they've actually taken over parts and um, basically checking people coming into the area. I've heard reports of Ukraine uh, on the verge of being torn apart. And it does feel as though something's imminent here. I mean, I'm here in in Odessa at the moment um, where everything's fairly relatively calm, to be honest. Today was quite a sunny day. Um, the only the only kind of things I've seen that would actually let you know that anything's going on here is, is like occasionally you get an entourage of cars with Ukrainian flags driving around in circles, honking their horns, and uh, and if you're obviously a pro-Ukrainian uh, supporter, then you would honk back, and if you're not, then you just probably remain silent. Um, there's rallies being held down by the port, and in other areas by pro-Russians and pro-Ukrainians. I use those terms just to make things simpler, they might not be technically correct or encompass um, or describe everyone's views, but it's just easier to use those terms. Uh, There are widely different views held here in Odessa, Uh, it seems to be a bit of a split here, whereas if you go to the West Ukraine, places like Lviv or Lvov, it's it's pronounced differently according to uh, whether you're Russian or Ukrainian. Um, if you go there, it's mostly pro-Ukrainian, but over here in Odessa, it's quite split. Now, Odessa would be a target if Putin does want to take over the whole of Ukraine, and who knows what his aims are at the moment. Um, but if he did, Odessa would definitely be a target. It's one of the biggest cities in in Ukraine, and it's a seaport. Um, but uh, it would be it would be a whole lot different to taking over parts of the east or taking over Crimea because there's it's um there's a much bigger sort of fifty fifty almost split on opinion here. It's kind of reassuring uh, in a way that it would be so difficult because I don't think it's going to be the first target. I would imagine if Putin is going to come into Ukraine, it's going to st- probably start in the east. At the moment, I'm just keeping my ear to the ground and. Um, making contacts. If I come across anyone of interest, then we'll interview them. Um, One story I've heard on the grapevine, and the source appears to come from Pravda, is that that some people suspect that the EU and the USA may be trying to strike a deal to give funds to Ukraine so they can um, have, have enough money to fight Putin if necessary, and Russia. Um... 
as long as they don't mind um, disposing um, of the EU and may possibly the US as well, nuclear waste on the on the land in the Chernobyl area. I don't know if that's true, it's just been reported in Pravda and I've heard some people mention that over here in Ukraine as well. There's a lot of stories going around, I mean everyone has their own version of events and I, I want to listen to all of them. I don't actually know which what's true and what isn't, it's really difficult to know. So last um, episode I had a chance to speak to Alexander, just a normal Ukrainian based in Odessa, works on ships and I, I like speaking to just normal people because I think they sometimes have a much better idea of what's going on because there's a lot of people in Ukraine that didn't want any of this to happen, um, the, the situation that's happening in Ukraine at the moment. A lot of it's been is, is a result of manipulation, manipulation by governments. Anyway, I met Alexander at a wedding party as I mentioned before and um, last week I, I played the second part of his um, interview uh, because the first part, the sound quality wasn't great. I've managed to sort of make a collage of some of his comments in the first part of the interview sound quality is not brilliant but I think it's not too bad so uh, forgive me if it's um, if, if there's a few if it's not perfect basically um, here's the first part of the interview with Alexander thanks again to Alexander to filter the information because a lot of fake information but I'll try to give you just my view for the situation all around the Ukraine it's really Russian aggressive action to take part of Ukraine. Why is it happening? For me that's difficult to understand, to understand uh, what moves Mr. Putin. I can just imagine about rebuilding maybe USSR or something like that. And I can tell the Russian newsmakers they making so fake news that's really makes me really angry when I'm watching the Russian news because I see the real situation and I see the news it's completely different can you give me an example of that uh, I can tell you just a few days ago I seen on the two Russian channels uh, on the news two interview from one guy on one channel he was introduced like a pro-Ukrainian protestant who was uh, doing some bad things by Russian opinion. But at the same day on another Russian channel, the same guy in the same place was introduced to the people like pro-Russian striker who get injured from the pro-Ukrainian or something. So th th that makes uh, some questions to the Russian news. So you mean like that he was just kind of acting different roles, yeah? About him, I don't, I don't know what he was doing because in Russian news we always see only part of the video. There's about the Maidan, what happens in winter time. Sometimes I see in Russian news uh, just five seconds of the video with the comments happens this and that. But then I seen already the complete video, like five minutes, and it gives a completely opposite uh, view of the situation. Some part uh, of the police and some part of militaries, they switch to another side to pro-Russian, let's say pro-Russian protestants. But uh, I can say on the east of Ukraine and on the south as well, but a bit less, with the police especially, that's a big story because some of policemen they are uh, scary to be under um, to be catched by new police let's say not new police but by new government because of the things what they did before so there is no way to back up for them so they switch to the pro-russian side and also a uh, few days ago the pro-russian strikers they catch the Mm, police officers in some cities and uh, SBU, I don't know really how to say in English, like uh, security office of Ukraine and inside there is folders with the names, family names, children and uh, all information about the policemen. 
and now this folder is controlled by pro-Russian strikers so you can imagine how it works so some of them might be scared yeah 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 some of them might be scared some of them might be controlled by some people in Eastern Europe just what I think I'm pro-Ukrainian completely for me there is no choice because of me I was born in Ukraine and I feel like Ukrainian and I really cannot understand the people who is Ukrainian but they are pro-Russian because why they are not uh, pro Mozambique or something why pro-Russian but I cannot imagine why it happens because of Russian news makers it works like propaganda and it works already for a long year uh, for many years ago uh, people who I know most of them are pro Ukrainians but there are still some pro Russians and some of them we lost uh, connections because of this problem but some of them we still communicate uh, I have a lot of friends really friends in uh, Crimea and some of them pro Russian but I would never make a mind war with them because of this problem because uh, how to explain our friendship I hope more strong than this problem but some people a uh, bit aggressive uh, my ex friends or colleagues we lost contact because of the problem but from one way it's even good because it means that friendship costs nothing if it breaks down because I never been uh, working in Crimea but I spent there uh, every summer before for a few days for a holiday it's really beautiful place with a nice people who I know and I bit sad what we lost I mean Ukraine lost Crimea and uh, since now I will never go to Crimea it's a bit, it's quite a popular holiday destination nice holiday destination for Ukrainians for Russians for everyone now I will not go because the majority of the citizens of Ukraine they were saying like we hate Ukrainians and we like Russians but mm. I'm Ukrainian and I to be honest I bit angry for those people so I'm going to continue to absorb the atmosphere here in Odessa and let you know what's going on. I reckon something's probably going to happen in the next few days, uh, so we'll, we'll report back to you on, on anything that happens and try and get some more interviews. Let's check in with Anthony, our um, academic researcher from Bilkent University in Turkey, and see what he has for us this week. Hello, Anthony. Hi, how are you? Yeah, not bad, thanks. How's things going with you? Not too bad, not too bad, thanks. Nice to be back. Now, where have you been? Uh, I haven't been anywhere, but I haven't been on Truth Sentinel for a while. <laughs> that's true, that's true, yeah. Well, it's good to have you back. Um, so what, what have you been looking at this week? Well, I wanted to change tack a little bit this week and uh, submit a movie review, movie review for you. Um, there's a, a movie released this month that uh, I think a lot of your in listeners might be interested in. Uh, the film's called uh, the the unknown known, and it's it's basically a, a 100 minute interview with Donald Rumsfeld. So you, you probably remember uh, Rumsfeld was one of the main architects of the invasion of Iraq, um, and because he was he was head of the Defense Department at that time, he was he was kind of the voice of the war, you know. Uh, but look, the film the film more or less speaks for itself. Uh, I wanted to talk about some of the issues that are that are brought up within the film and about uh, Rumsfeld and what he represents. Um, I, I think most people probably remember uh, remember him from his, his time as the Secretary of Defense you know, during the Bush administration because he, he gave all of those press conferences about the Iraq war. He really you know, took center stage and people have quoted him a lot. Um, we had a very good look at him. But <clears throat> And I also think uh, Americans probably know uh, quite a lot about his, his career before that in, in US politics. But for the rest of us, I, I think he seemed to, to pop up sort of fully formed, uh, you know, under underneath uh, George W. Bush. <laughs> um, but actually, I, I think he's a, he's a very interesting figure historically because he, he represents... Um, he, he represents a kind of uh, information... 
management that, that we're seeing a lot nowadays in politics. Uh, and the Grumsall was around uh, at a time when the, the, a lot of the techniques that, that we see these days uh, were, were being formed, and, and he participated in that to a certain extent. So, so in particular, I mean, on, on this show, we, t we talk a lot about how, how governments and the media uh, collude to, to manage information, and how they, they do this to try and affect the way people perceive what's going on, going on in the world. And, and if we look at an individual like this, uh, and we, we can track some of the techniques they use and, and try to understand uh, what's going on. When we, for example, hear a press conference you know, on CNN or whatever. Okay, no, that sounds very, uh, very useful. Please go on and tell us more. All right, well, um, look, I think in a, in a lot of cases, these, these information management techniques, uh, you can trace them back to the early Cold War years, because that was when governments really started to cotton on to how important it is to manage information, um, especially in a, in a democracy. And um, uh, there's this phrase, manufacturing consent, which Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky made famous. The, the need to manufacture the consent of the people uh, really, I think, became obvious to governments during, during the Cold War, you know, after they'd seen how effectively the Nazis had used propaganda, and so on and so on. Um, so, in, in terms of where, where Rumsfeld fits into all that, um, he's he's been around for quite a long while, and I think you could say he was probably one of the pioneers of our of our information environment. Um, so, you know, he doesn't come across as a terribly interesting figure. I think he just seems like a an extremely annoying <laughs> conservative guy, <laughs> but but he he does get a little in, more interesting if you delve into this. Um, he he's been involved in a lot of those uh, you know shadowy groups within governments type type projects. You know, um, th these little committees and task forces that that get set up from time to time, and they're you know deeply embedded within departments and so on. So so they're not really operating in in plain sight. And. Um... It always seems to me like it's those people that actually do hold the most power because as as governments come and go or the face, the public face of governments like, say, Obama and Bush and uh, people like that, they don't really actually wield that much power. There's people in the background that are always there. And when the new government comes in, they're always in the background advising and stuff. So they probably have more power than the actual governments. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's, there's a remarkable degree of consistency. Um, in, in these people who are just one step removed from the public faces of power. You know, they, they tend to survive elections and spills and so on. Um, and look, I, I know the idea is a bit out of, out of fashion at the moment, this, this idea of the you know, shadowy government within the government and so on. But uh, I think that uh, you do have to at least look at these groups if you, if you want to get uh, a, a good idea of you know, information management and, and I guess some some more general issues uh, related to geopolitics, um, and just to ask whether they they really do have an influence or not. And in Rumsfeld's case, it's it's pretty clear that some of the the groups that he's participated in really did affect the political discourse in America, um, and in some cases we can still see the effects today. Um, and also, I think another point to make is that that. Some of these, uh, some of these groups of which he's been a, a part and a, and a driving force have, have taken, taken the Americans and I, I suppose the rest of us too into some really dark territory. Um, so look, I, I'm just going to focus on one example, uh, and uh, again, we need we need a bit of background here, but I'll, I'll try to make it as concise as possible. Okay, sounds um, good. When uh, when Nixon resigned in 1974. Uh, Gerald Ford took over the presidency, and, and he retained uh, the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, who'd worked with Nixon. And at that time, um, there was this sense that the Cold War had brought the US and the USSR far too close to an open confrontation. You know, we'd had the Bay of Pigs and the missile crisis and so on. And there was, I would say, almost an acknowledgement in the US that... Um, 
some of that fear of communism had had really been really been overblown, you know. Um, so so McCarthyism was discredited, and uh, Vietnam had kind of discredited this idea of the domino effect, you know, that, that politicians like Kennedy had had talked about, um, and all that kind of thing. People were um, pe people were tired of that, I suppose you could say. So, so then you, you had this period of détente emerging with the Soviets. Nixon actually started the process, and uh, during Ford's administration, he and, and Kissinger talked about it talked about détente a lot. Um, so, scaling back the paranoia, creating a friendly climate, cooperating cooperation amongst the superpowers, that kind of stuff. But the problem is that the the far right in America just hated it. They they um, it was anathema to them. So, at that time, you had a, a bunch of uh, disaffected conservative intellectuals who kind of converged on Washington. Uh, most of them had, had started their careers in academia, but they'd been kicked out because they were basically crackpots. And <laughs> uh, they kind of assembled under the under the banner of a political philosopher called Leo Strauss. Now, he's a nut. Uh, but he's an interesting nut because his his main idea was uh, that in order to bring in order for America to move forward, myths had to be created for it to give it a sense of unity and destiny and, and so on. And the philosophy of this guy sort of called these these various people to, to public life. Yeah. Um, now these are the guys who we much later came to know as the neoconservatives. You know, all the Wolfowitz and, and William Crystal and all those guys. Um, but they were already around in the 1970s, and uh, the, the, this detente thing it just annoyed the shit out of them. <laughs> um, because because up to that point the USSR had been a kind of scary all-purpose enemy. And uh, if that scary all-purpose enemy went away, then there would be no way of you know uniting Americans behind this mission to rid the world of evil. You know? and, and they knew that the that the mission was false, but they they their belief was that it was necessary to kind of get America back on track. You know, there had been so much social unrest in the '60s, and Vietnam had been a disaster. So they felt like we needed this um, this myth. That, that America was the, the the soldier of good in a world threatened by evil, you know. So um, Rumsfeld was one of a few uh, figures in American political life who kind of allied themselves to these guys. He was never a neocon, but he he uh, he, I guess, threw his lot in with them because he shared certain aims with them. And uh, as Ford and Kissinger were talking about détente. These guys, these Straussians, and a bunch of others, including Rumsfeld, got together over dinner one night and formed something quite amazing, which they called Team B. Now, now I, I think some people have heard about Team B, but, but I also think it should be uh, way more famous than it is. Because if we're talking about you know scary groups within a government you know working to pervert public policy, this is the archetypal one. Couldn't they um, have? Um, couldn't they have come up with a scarier name, though? <laughs> they should have. Yeah. <laughs> should have been the Bloods, but I think mm. that was already taken. <laughs> um, so it was a really nasty, horrible idea. Um, and if we look at some of the more recent uh, episodes in, in, in U.S. political life, uh, Iraq again being an obvious example, then, then we can see this Team B as essentially, uh, I would say, one of the templates for this. So. Basically, what they did, they they were a committee and they evaluated intelligence reports, uh, especially if they were connected to the Soviets. And Rumsfeld uh, used his influence to get access to these reports, so he was able to access uh, data gathered by the CIA and other agencies. And essentially, what Team B did with these with this data was to reinterpret all of it in the scariest way possible, <laughs> and then. <laughs> Accuse other government agencies, especially the CIA, of being uh, grossly negligent. They they were accused of vastly underestimating the Soviet threat. But 
they did this in, in very strange ways. Um, they, they, Team B said the Soviets were, were gaining superiority all the time, though you and I know that, you know, this was the mid-70s, the, the USSR was already beginning to fall apart. <laughs> um, and they were, you know, according to Team B, they were developing all kinds of new weapons. They were a generation ahead of, of US weapon technology, and they were preparing for a first strike. So, <laughs> so they, they just made... They just make bizarre claims. I mean, they, they, essentially, they essentially imagined any terrifying thing that the Soviets might do and then said that they were already doing it. <laughs> they looked at um, a, a, an example I really like. They, they looked at this, these satellite photos of a Russian radar facility at a city called Krasnoyarsk. And they said, look, these radar towers are actually hiding the real hardware at Krasnoyarsk. Um, and what the Russians really have there is, is laser beam weapons. <laughs> So, and you know, you, you have to remember that like, this is in the in the period where like Battlestar Galactica was on TV, the, you know, the original one, and Star Wars was just to come, just about to come out. So the Russians have got lasers, you know. But um, um but um, I mean, there is talk that they that we do have laser technology these days. I mean, um, so surely anything's possible. It wouldn't surprise me at all if we had laser technology these days. Well, I mean, we do. You know, we use it for for optical surgery. Um, but, you know, anything that's, that's used in uh, a medical context has probably been weaponized, or at least somebody has attempted to weaponize it at some point. But, yeah, so in the mid-70s, here they are saying the Russians have got lasers, they've developed new ways of detecting nuclear submarines, blah, 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 blah. Um, so, but they also, at the same time, they, they developed uh, a really key technique, which, again, we, we can still see today. Um, when, when somebody doubted their claims and, and expressed that, so Team B had this way of casting that, that person or, or that agency as irresponsible and saying that they were you know, putting the lives of Americans at risk and so on. See, the, 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 CIA, um, the CIA investigated all the claims in Team B's reports. They, Team B would, would issue a report and the CIA would go, okay, we'll check it. And they didn't find a single shred of evidence for any of the things that, that Team B claimed were happening in the USSR. <laughs> but meanwhile, you had Rumsfeld out, you know, in the media making speeches, and the media just airing these speeches about the um, the Soviets and their emerging military dominance, and um, you know the progress that they were making, and how we were becoming complacent. And then Team B would would just fire back at the CIA. And they had this quote which they like to use. Um, it was a, just an old saying. Um, it's being used in the past to argue for the existence of God. <laughs> and they grabbed it and thought, oh yes, that'll do us. So the quote was, um, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Uh, a bit like the known unknown quote that um, Rumsfeld, was it Rumsfeld that used later? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. These are, these are very closely related. And they, and they used this idea to say that, look, if... If the CIA can't find any evidence of a threat, and therefore it decides there's no threat, that's negligent. So you've got this kind of uh, through the looking glass way of, of, of seeing potential threats to US security and, and US citizens and, and so on. And Rumsfeld actually mentions this in the documentary. He, he wrote a memo to himself in 2002, and you can see uh, the subject uh, of the memo. The subject was uh, discussed with P. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So P is the president. <laughs> so this means Rumsfeld went and talked to George W. Bush sometime in the lead up to Iraq about this this idea. Yeah. Um, so you can start to see, you know, where these, these, these formative um, ideas lead us in some senses to, to where we are now. But but I think the most extraordinary thing about this Team B is just how much influence it had. There were just circumstances at the time that made it um, very much more significant than you, than you might think. So um, when they started building up the USSR again as this you know, monstrous super enemy, they, they, they had some takers, you know, they had some old cold warriors from the 50s who loved this idea of let's have another showdown. And, so they started supporting T Team B. The CIA came under attack. Detente came under attack. And uh, to some extent, public 
perceptions started to shift back into this kind of paranoid, you know, 50s, 60s, reds under the bed kind of mode. And they were, at the same time, you know, these arms manufacturers and these lobbies um, were also uh, willing to support this idea because, you know, America had just come out of a war as the loser. So people were, I think, really quite shell-shocked by that. And, and detente had a certain appeal because it, it meant, you know, not going overseas again to get beaten up <laughs> by foreigners. So, but, but the problem is if it succeeded, then the livelihood of people in the arms industry was potentially out the window. Um, so you had generals on side, you had arms manufacturers on side, and you had this guy called Ronald Reagan who was challenging President, President Ford for the Republican nomination. And Reagan was always a big fan of like these these nutcase right wing doomsday scenarios. He loved all that stuff, you know. He'd, he'd come from Hollywood. The the nuttier it could be, the more he liked it. So he grabbed a hold of Team B and he pushed forward um, any time he could to say that he was weak and that he was ignoring an imminent threat and blah 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 blah. And Ford um, changed tack. He he needed to stay in office, so the word detente was removed from all speeches. That was a huge issue because the word was the symbol of a new era of cooperation between the superpowers. He removed it from all public speeches, all White House statements, and started moving on to this, this military footing. And then, of course, Reagan won the election. And actually, this was the beginning of this kind of rearming America phase. You know, this, this military industrial complex that people talk about so much was really established in that, in that period. So, so I think what we can see here is uh, people are inclined to dismiss this idea of, you know, like like a, 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 a black government, you know, a government within a government. <laughs> people are inclined to dismiss these ideas, I think, but they uh, but they can have real world consequences. And, and in the case of TMB, they really did. You know, now the military industrial complex is a fact of life, um, but it wasn't. Uh, it was brought into being at least partly by this kind of underhanded, you know, backroom group who had its own agenda. Um, and of course, there are the, there are the, the other part of their agenda was was having an enemy to unite against. You know, I mean, we, we've seen this over and over again. Like, we, we've seen, I mean, right through to Osama bin Laden. You know, you need you need a face of evil or a focus of evil. You know, and after a while, they just they just became more and more ludicrous. I mean, during uh, Reagan's presidency, they went to war with Nicaragua, <laughs> and and Reagan was saying that Nicaragua was an imminent threat to the safety of United, the United States. You know, it was a communist base. The entire Caribbean was going to fall to communism. So, like, we have to act against Nicaragua, otherwise, our our nation uh, is threatened with extinction. <laughs> it sounds a bit like um, it sounds a bit like what Putin's doing in Ukraine at the moment, sort of saying that. You know, uh, Russians have an imminent threat against these fascists uh, that have uh, risen up in Ukraine when it doesn't seem to be the case at all. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's a small element of that, but it definitely wasn't a big threat. Yeah, absolutely. And in the case of fascism, I mean, it's used, it's used uh, in, in Russia and Eastern Europe in a similar way to how communism is used in the West, you know, as a kind of uh, bogeyman word, you know. Um, uh, you're definitely seeing it in the Russian media now, and and ominously enough, you saw it as a as a major um, a major accusation uh, in the lead up to the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. You know that the Croatians uh, under President Tuđman were fascists, and this really resonates with people in that part of the world because their countries were swept through by fascists during World War II, and those fascists killed lots and lots of people. So if you can brand somebody a fascist then, you know, your work is done. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, but I mean, branding, you know, Manuel Noriega <laughs> in Panama or, or, or branding uh, the Nicaraguan Sandinistas, Sandinistas as, a, as a threat to Western civilization, it's pretty funny. Um, but it worked because by then, uh, you know, this was a pattern and, and the information was being very carefully managed. And to the extent that the government needed to manufacture consent, they were able to do it. Um, so eventually, if you go far enough down this road, you, you get to Iraq. 
And what you see there is, in many cases, the same individuals employing the same tactics. You know, sometime before the war, um, Paul Wolfowitz and, and others who'd been uh, who who'd sat on the Team B committee. They formed another little insider government committee called the Policy Counterterrorism Evaluation Group, um, and essentially that was a that was a Team B reboot. They were doing the same stuff um, again, using Rumsfeld and other people who had the inside um, the security clearance. They accessed data from uh, intelligence committee files, and then they just trashed everybody else's interpretations of that data and accused everybody. Uh, of being irresponsible, you know, we can't see any WMDs, so we conclude there isn't. We conclude there aren't any WMDs, and then the, the policy counterterrorism evaluation group would say, "You're putting the lives of Americans at risk." So, um, and, and they were again founded on this premise that there's there's no obligation to produce any evidence. You just um, you, you just say, well, you know, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. And that means you can then proceed as if it was there. Um, so, yeah, this is a pattern that we've seen repeated many times. And it also was the, the, the wall that they managed to pull over George W. Bush's eyes. You know, his, his father hated Rumsfeld, hated the neocons, but somehow they convinced him. You know, he saw no evidence of WMDs in Iraq. No problem. That is an evidence of absence. So no evidence of links between Saddam and September 11th. Well, that is an evidence of absence, and, and so on. And you know, again, Rumsfeld was Rumsfeld was right in on this, um, and it did, as we saw, change public policy in some disastrous ways. You know. And now, now, now we're in the era of Obama and Kerry, who, in my view. Are, are the next step. I, I think Obama and Kerry don't feel they have to make any attempt at all to produce evidence. I mean, Obama just walks up to a microphone in 2010 and says, look, we got bin Laden, but you can't see the body <laughs> because we thought that would be a little disrespectful. So we dumped it at sea. And it seems like a lot of people just go, oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. I, I must admit, I, I just I still find that incredible. Um, it is. And I think there are a lot of people in the world still who that's not a big problem for. But for me, that is a big problem. Uh, I want to see I want to see evidence. And saying you dumped the body at sea out of respect doesn't even make sense. I mean, if, uh, previously we were told by the same government that um, you know he's not really a Muslim. He's you know he's uh, he doesn't um, actually believe any of the values that of the Muslim religion. Um, so it doesn't even make sense that they would give him respect and, um, and bury his body at sea. It's, it's a complete cover-up, and anyone with any intelligence, I think, not, has to know that, surely. Yeah, and I think that, um, I, I mean, I think that, that after the amount of, the, of suffering that bin Laden is alleged to have wreaked on the US public, um, just saying, oh, we killed him, but you can't see him, is grounds for impeachment. Personally, I, I think if I was, if I was American, Especially if I'd lost somebody on September 11, 2001, I'd be outraged. Um, I want to know what became of the, the person who, you know, murdered my loved one. Um, I don't want some politician to walk up to a microphone and say, "We got him. We threw him away. You can't see him." Bye. Yeah, this and then and then if you say, uh, "No, wait, can I, I? No, I think that's wrong. What, what's happening here?" Um, you'd be like, "Are you a conspiracy theorist?" <laughs> Why? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. I know. I mean, they, they think, you know, he and Kerry think they can just go for it. You know, you just look at the Obama speeches about Russia. You know, they're entirely fact-free. He just goes with whatever the US media says is happening over there. And, and that's, you know, they, they have uh, they've established a, a, a pattern of what people expect to hear them say about Russia. And they'll just keep saying that stuff. Um, and they're, you know, often quite uninformed. Uh, but, but look, people like Obama, they, they know people, they know that uh, a significant amount of the population will, will just be okay with whatever they say. So so that's where we're at now. And, and as I said at the start, I think, I don't think it emerged out of nowhere. I think we can trace it back. And I think it's important to understand how the people who are holding the reins of power now manage to, manage to get away with uh, 
doing such a shoddy job of it. And, and this, this kind of, uh, I suppose, this softening up process, this information management is, is certainly part of it. Okay, let's just take a quick break and then we can continue after the break. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. Okay, we're back from our break. We had a little a bit of a chat there and um, we're gonna, just going to summarize um, what uh, Anthony was talking about. Anthony, what, um, what implications does uh, what you were talking about have for the present day? Well, I mean, as I was uh, uh, saying before the break, um, we are we are now living in a in a you know an information sphere, and I think we see uh, everywhere we see governments grappling with with how to manage information uh, in a way that uh, increases our chances of consenting to allow them to do what they want to do. You know, you can see it everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's if it's uh, Erdogan here in Turkey um, trying to, you know, get rid of embarrassing scandals by, by shutting down YouTube or, you know, the propaganda war that's happening in Russia and Ukraine at the moment. Um, they're, you know, shutting off each other's TV channels and invading each other's studios and so on. Uh, and of course, in the US, there's all kinds of, you know, propaganda going, there's all kinds of, uh, sorry, information management going on. 2011, uh, there was a really interesting example. Uh, President Obama made a speech about Cuba and why the blockade should continue. Absolutely ludicrous, as all of his predecessors have been. <laughs> and uh, Castro responded directly, and it was hilarious. Um, the word stupid came out of Castro's mouth more than once. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, don't, don't, you think, are... um, sorry, don't you think the information... Um control them must have gone a bit wrong with their attempt to go to war in Syria with uh, Obama and, and Kerry because it just seemed to be a real feeble attempt and nobody sort of fell for it. It seemed like they really didn't get it right that time. I agree, I agree. I think they were still new to the game at that point. Um, and I also think that uh, there's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, Middle Eastern stability encouraging fatigue you know when we when we uh, when we hear US politicians saying we have to go in to, to promote stability in the region I think Americans and obviously others are just tired of hearing that you know we've been hearing it for so long it's like oh not again <laughs> so yeah I, I don't think they took that into account yeah and um we're not we're not knocking it. We're not knocking Americans here. We're, we're when we're talking about this subject, we're talking about American governments. I just want yeah. to make that clear because we have got American listeners. So and I know some people are quite sensitive. So I just want to say oh, we're, we're not we're not and we and, you know, both of us have American friends as well. So it's not like we're knocking Americans. We are we're talking about the American government and some of their policies. I, I'm always a big uh, I, I I pull people up on this uh, from time to time because I I do think that. Sometimes people don't draw the distinction uh, uh, clearly enough between the people who live in a country and the government of that country. And if there's one country in the world where you must draw that distinction, it's the USA, because the government and the people, I mean, the, the people have so little control over what's going on. I could not have more contempt for the current Australian government, but I hope that their actions uh, don't reflect on me because if they do it's completely unfair. I don't support a single one of their actions And that's the same for myself. I'm often judged um, and have been judged verbally um, People uh, in Ukraine have sometimes said to me, you know, have started talking about what my government's done and why did I come to Ukraine? And, um, you know, why did my Prime Minister do such and such and there's been other times in my life where people have talked about English uh, people from England or and you can't you really can't bracket the whole country um, uh, into the same mentality as the people in the government because most of the time the co uh, common people have nothing to do with what their prime ministers or leaders do yeah I absolutely agree I mean the idea that that, that you're in control because you get to vote every three or four years is, is pretty laughable yeah, and you know what? Like, I think uh, in the time when the um, the Mayflower left Southampton in England and Portsmouth as well, um, I think I would have probably been on that ship. So, I, I think I'm a closet American anyway myself. <laughs> closet American—that's a new one. <laughs> <laughs>
Anyway, um, can you tell us um, how people... Could, you mentioned this was about a film that you'd watched. Can you tell us the, the yeah, name yeah. of the film and where people can, can watch this film? Yeah, the film. I knew I'd eventually get back to the film. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's called The Unknown Known. Uh, it has done the, the awards and festival circuit already. Uh, and it's in limited release in the USA this month. I'm not too sure about other English-speaking countries, but I'm guessing... UK, New Zealand, Australia, and, and so on are going to get it within the next uh, few weeks to a month. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks for telling us about it today, and um, I hope you'll come back in uh, coming episodes and tell us what you're researching at the time. No problem, no problem. Thanks for having me again. Okay, take it easy. Goodbye. You too, bye. So, um, topics coming up in future episodes, um, we're going to have all kinds of topics. You know, we'll talk about the paranormal, we'll talk about mysteries, conspiracies, um, 9-11, the Illuminati, genetic engineering, World War Three, anything that, that sort of uh, sparks our interest. We'll also do reviews of um, documentaries on related topics. Hopefully next week, um, one of our uh, researchers and reviewers called Luke will be giving us a review on um, some documentaries. We generally use first names on this show just because it's um, although we're not always talking about sensitive information, in this day and age it's better to be safe than sorry. I think it's just better to use people's first names rather than, than, than giving away information all the time. Um, occasionally we'll be doing reviews of documentaries, also other shows, conspiracy style shows like Caravan to Midnight with John B. Wells. Usually um, good episodes there. I've listened to a few of those recently. They've been pretty good. Alex Jones, often misunderstood and not always liked, but I still respect him. His heart's in the right place. Um, Hagman and Hagman. Um, David Icke. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of different shows out there. We'll also be looking at economic markets, sports and weather. Uh, finance news. Uh, Royal Bank of Scotland has been fined um, about half a million pounds by Hong Kong regulators because it didn't um, detect some unauthorized transactions by one of its traders. I mean, I'm not exactly... Um, I feel like sometimes I don't really understand finance and economics to the level I'd like to, to understand what's going on. I think if I did, I'd probably be quite shocked. So anyway, next episode, or in a coming episode soon, we're going to have someone come on and explain um, some of the stuff that's been going on. Uh, so that should be quite helpful. Regarding sports, um, there's been violent protests in Rio less than two months before the World Cup. Apparently it was sparked by the death of a, um, a dancer who was beaten up by police. It'd be interesting to see whether, they, whether the World Cup's going to start smoothly and what are they going to be able to do to stop people from speaking out or protesting around that area. Formula One boss Bernie Ecclestone um, has appeared in court to face bribery charges and you know we'll, we'll just be looking um, basically at sports and seeing if there's anything there that needs to be looked at. I mean one thing I'd like to say is that um, how important are sports to us? I mean some people say that they divide, divert our attention away from the real issues. I know today I was sitting next to a football fan who screamed and started shouting when his team scored a goal and you know I've done something similar uh, maybe on a rare occasion when England um, international team have been doing well, which is quite rare. Um, so I'm not criticising supporting a team, but I'm talking about people whose entire life seems to be based around supporting one particular team to the extent that it is their life, basically, and they can be filled with um, joy or hate. Um, and it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. It seems a bit crazy because um, at the end of the day, you can't actually influence your team that much. So it doesn't even seem logical to be get depressed if your team loses, loses or um, to be so full of hate when someone on the pitch does something stupid. It's not really particularly logical. I, mean, I can understand it to a point. I'm just saying that maybe some people go too far. What do you think about that? We'll also be looking at weather um, on, on uh, Truth Sentinel. There's a lot to be discussed. Um, I want to try to invite people on to talk about global warming. Do you think it's a, a phenomenon that's happening? There seems to be a lot, they seem to be ramping up the fear factor regarding um, global warming. 
Um, I was reading about Asian air pollution. Air pollution in China and other Asian countries is is apparently getting to um, dangerous levels. Um, so I'll, we'll be doing some reports on on the weather and why this seems to be escalating. Trying to find out why it's escalating. At least the blood moon passed without the doomsday events occurring. Uh, you know, as well as weather, we can be looking at asteroids and. Um, I was reading that um, there's been quite a few asteroids that have hit the Earth in recent years and um, a US based group uh, which includes a number of former um, NASA um, employees has been sort of trying to show that there's been a lot more asteroid impacts than than people would realize and some of them been quite big. Um, some of them obviously broke up before they entered our atmosphere um, uh, I mean, one of the more famous ones would be the one that hit uh, Chelyabinsk in um, in Russia. I mean, a lot of people saw that on the TV and on YouTube, and that was about 20 meters wide, but it still uh, it still affected people in that city, and you know, shattered windows. I think there were some injuries as well. Finish today on a positive note. A baby Java mouse deer, one of the smallest uh, hoofed animals in the world was born at a zoo in southern Spain. It's about the size of um, a hamster apparently. Um, so if ever you really fancied having your own little pet deer that was as big as your hand, they do exist. Of course, um, if you wait a bit longer, genetic experiments um, genetic experiments will, will make it possible for all of us to have our own little miniature pet animals um, at some point in the future. So just hang on. Thanks again for listening. If you have any um, suggestions on how this channel could be improved, please get in contact. Um, please let us know if you would like to come and speak to us about anything really. You can go to our Facebook page, our Twitter page, or you can just contact us via YouTube. Thanks for listening. Catch you later.